Good afternoon and welcome uh, to the second of a series of innovation conversations to mark the University of Oxford Vice Chancellor's Innovation Awards. My name is Paul Ashley. I'm the Head of Licensing and Ventures at Oxford University Innovation. And I'm very pleased to be uh, introducing and talking to Professor Robert McLaren, uh, Professor of Ophthalmology in the Department of Clinical Neurosciences here in Oxford. Robert is the winner of the Inspiring Leader category and the overall winner of this year's Innovation Awards for his role in the creation and growth of Nightstar, the retinal gene therapy company. These awards celebrate the quality and breadth of research-led innovation here at the university. Um, and just to give you one example of how this activity is flourishing uh, across Oxford, Nightstar was the university's 104th spin-out company when it was created in 2014. And earlier this month, uh, we established our 244th company. But as you will hear today, uh, the Nightstar story is truly one that stands out from that crowd and one that we're rightly proud of uh, as a great example of how top quality academic science can be rapidly translated into commercial success and fundamental clinical impact. So there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions of Robert through me. If you have questions, do add them to the, uh, the chat window in, in YouTube or to the university's Twitter feed. Um, but without further delay, I'm very pleased to hand over to Professor McLaren. Well, uh, thank you very much indeed um, for joining us this evening. Um, I'm Robert McLaren. I'm Professor of Ophthalmology at the University of Oxford. And I'd just like to say how, how honoured and delighted I am to have been uh, the recipient of the uh, Vice Chancellor's Innovation Award uh, this year. It, it really is a, a huge accolade, uh, not just for me, but, but for the whole team uh, here at the Oxford Eye Hospital and in the Nuffield Laboratory of Ophthalmology, which is part of the Department of Clinical Neurosciences at the John Radcliffe Hospital um, in Oxford. So our work is really looking at gene therapy um, gene therapy in its simple terms is treating a disease with DNA rather than the traditional treatments with pills or proteins or, or other drugs. And of course, the recent experience we have with COVID and the development of vaccines has shown just how important that is and how rapid progress has been made uh, with DNA technologies in recent years. Now, we're interested in treating inherited retinal degenerations. These are genetic diseases that cause blindness in people, uh, mainly young people. And in fact, they are now the most common cause of blindness, untreatable blindness in, in the young uh, in the UK. So it's clearly a very important area of research. Quite often, these genetic diagnoses, the genetic diseases are diagnosed quite early on. Uh, there may be a family history and we know precisely why that individual is going blind slowly. It's usually uh, constriction of the visual field and gradual extinction of the vision due to the death of the photoreceptor cells, which are the light sensing cells that line the retina at the back of the eye. So, you know, this is a huge area of interest for us as ophthalmologists, because if it's a genetic disease, we can use gene therapy potentially to treat it. And indeed, that would probably be the most effective way of doing so. So if we go back in time, back to around about 2009, uh, shortly after I came to Oxford as a newly appointed academic consultant, I began working with my colleague Miguel Ciabra at Imperial College to look at the genetics of a disease known as choroideremia. And this is a condition that causes blindness in young men, normally presents in late childhood and causes a progressive constriction of the visual field. It became apparent to me that the missing gene in choroideremia would quite easily fit into the viral vector that we use called adeno-associated virus. And together with Miguel Ciabra, who was an expert on the protein and how to assess the protein, we applied to the NIHR Health Innovation Challenge Fund, which is a joint partnership between NIHR and Wellcome Trust. And we were fortunate to get funding to start a clinical trial to test a new gene therapy in patients with choroideremia. And one of the great things about Oxford is that we've got the labs to test all the science at a very high level. Uh, in fact, the, the scrutiny of the laboratory science that underpinned the trial was at the level where the regulatory authorities uh, would accept it uh, for a clinical trial. And at the same time, we've got a fantastic clinical trial infrastructure that supports clinical trials led by academics in Oxford. So 
with the successful funding we got from the Health Innovation Challenge Fund, we then started the first gene therapy trial, the first in the world for this disease, which was initially described in 1872, so over 100, almost 150 years ago. It's a very exciting time for us. And when we did the gene therapy on these patients, we noticed that some of the patients had improvements in their vision. And, and as we did more treatments, we, we understood more about this mechanism and it was looking extremely promising. So around about that time, I would say probably after the first two years of the trial, we got in contact with um, Oxford University Innovation and we uh, met up with Paul Ashley and his team. And we decided that it would be a good time to think about the next stage of the program, which would include a phase two trial, a phase three trial, you know, big global trials. And to do that, we formed the spin-out company Nightstar. And the name Nightstar came from one of our patients who was treated with the gene therapy vector, who emailed me in the middle of the night and said, I, I went outside this evening, Professor McLaren, I can't believe it. I looked up at the sky and for the first time, I could see the night stars. And of course, that was because the improvements in the night vision had resulted from the gene therapy. So that was a wonderful story. And of course, the name Nightstar then, then stuck. So Nightstar enabled us to form a company around the program because as academics, we do very good phase one trials, first in man studies. But to get an approved product, you do need to then go at a high level. You need to people employed who are not academics. You need people who understand the regulatory process, drug development, all these sorts of things. And the company structure provides us with the opportunity to do that. Um, I was very fortunate to be invited to continue role, my role with the company as a company director uh, to continue with the research. And then subsequently, we looked at other research programs in my lab for other diseases particularly X-linked retinitis pigmentosa, which is another genetic cause of blindness in young people, and also in Stargardt disease and some other treatments. And these other programs were then licensed by the university to Nightstar. So rather than just having one single disease to treat, Nightstar was then a portfolio of gene therapies for different diseases. And as a result of that, we were able to get funding, sufficient funding for a, a listing on NASDAQ, uh, which was uh, in 2017. And then subsequently, we had some extremely positive results from the trial for X-linked retinitis pigmentosa. And the company Nightstar was bought out by Biogen uh, in 2019 for $877 million, which uh, I've been told is, represents one of the largest uh, British biotech buyouts of all time, uh, which is quite exciting. Now, the company that obviously bought out Nightstar, Biogen, is a huge US biotechnology company, one of the top 20 in the world, and is now facilitating international clinical trials across America, North America, South America, Europe, now looking at expanding into Japan uh, and Australasia at a level that just wouldn't have been possible for us as academics in Oxford. But all of that program, all of that international program, probably with more people treated for a single gene disorder than any other disease to date, all of that happened from the original ideas that we developed in Oxford, the initial funding we had, and those first patients we treated at the John Radcliffe Hospital. So I think it's a great example of how academic medicine can progress and how there really is an important role for us as academics, particularly when we're trying to approach these very rare diseases, which companies may not look at as being commercially viable at the, at the beginning. But if we can show proof of principle and the potential for new therapies, they then become a great interest. So thank you very much indeed for listening to all of that. Um, I hope it's fairly clear. And as I said, I'm delighted to be involved in this program and also, it's a wonderful result for our patients, uh, many of whom, before the formation of Nightstar, would have had no option for any treatment at all, um, and many of whom now have had positive results in the clinical trials. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Robert, for that uh, fantastic overview and, uh, and insight into the, the Nightstar journey. Um, I'm going to start with a few questions. We have a, a couple of questions coming through. Um, firstly, it's one of uh, um, what, what challenges and opportunities you faced. I'm very conscious that when we filed our first patent with you in 2010, uh, gene therapy was um, uh, relatively new. There certainly weren't any approved therapies in, in Europe. Um, and I, I'm interested to know how you found working with such a sort of step change innovation and and what challenges there were to try and get the research program going? Well, that's a very good question. Um, any clinical trial really must start with safety. And on the other hand, in order to get approval for a clinical trial, 
you, you do really need to have some sign of efficacy or at least some, some notion of efficacy. So we were actually able to get regulatory approval for our trial using research data that was generated uh, exclusively within the academic setting. That means within the university laboratories, both using in vivo models of retinal degeneration, um, as well as using uh, patient samples, fibroblasts to show efficacy. So if you can do that uh, in your university environment to show potentially safety and efficacy, you then need to think about the clinical trial design so that you design the trial in such a way that it is as safe as possible. And normally for phase one studies, what we do is we do something called dose escalation, where you start at a low dose and you gradually build up to a higher dose. And whilst it's true that retinal gene therapy at the time was completely novel, the concept of gene therapy for other diseases has been in the clinical scenario for a number of years. So if you read your literature and you dig down deep, you will find clinical studies have been done elsewhere using similar vectors, similar approaches, similar components that will also generate a significant amount of safety data. And as a result of all of that, we were able to get approval for our phase one trial without doing any um, non-human primate studies, uh, which was quite an achievement because many people at the time gave their opinion that I would never be successful without um, a lot of non-human primate data, which of course wasn't needed in, in the end. Yeah, that's fantastic. One question about um, a collaboration. You mentioned uh, Miguel Ciabra at Imperial um, and, and the, the sort of multidisciplinary requirements of a, of a journey like this, not, not only in the lab and uh, in the, the research, but also in the creation of the company. And then that, that real leap from a, an early stage spin out company to a NASDAQ listing and an acquisition by Biogen. What sort of things have been required there? Well, that's a very long story, of course, and, and I'm pleased to say it, it's been a very successful one. Um, I would say to anyone starting in this sort of work, you know, I am an ophthalmologist, I'm an eye surgeon. I mean, I run a lab and I do research, but I'm not an expert in protein biochemistry. And a particular disease that I was interested in treating whilst I saw it in patients was not a disease that I was particularly familiar with at the molecular level. So one of the first things I realized is that you can't do this on your own. I need you to form a team and get on board the world's leading molecular biologist who works on the protein biochemistry of the missing gene, because I can do an experiment and show that the virus works in my lab. But how much more convincing is that if you do it together with someone who is a world renowned expert who can then validate your, your data? Um, and similarly, um, <clears throat> When I wanted to do the clinical trial, I could have, of course, just had my own patients in Oxford and, and been the, the PI as a clinician. But I knew that there were three other academic consultant ophthalmologists in the UK who were very good in genetics, who would be undoubtedly reviewers of the application at some stage. Uh, and I just felt that it would be much stronger to have a team. Because then we went to the, uh, the, to the grant panel and also for the ethics committee, not me as an individual, but with a team of individuals. A molecular biologist, scientific expert. We also had an expert virologist, a vector scientist, and a clinical team of ophthalmologists who understand the disease and the implications. And I think that's really, I would say to you, it's it's the sort of blurred area of, of leadership in academia, which we don't necessarily get taught directly. We, we, we have to learn it. As academics, we're instinctively digging down and, and narrow in our own silos of expertise because that's kind of how academics work. But when you come to a program like this, you need to bring people together across all academic disciplines and clinical disciplines. Because when the team in front of you is clearly the world leading team for that disease, it's very unlikely that you, you know the grant application or the subsequent trial application will be unsuccessful because the people reviewing it uh, will see the expertise in, in front of them. And I would say that's absolutely the approach to take when forming a, a new company and understanding that, you know, there are multiple areas of expertise that you need to bring into a new company to help it to grow through various, various stages. I have a question that's linked to one that's come through um, on the, the YouTube channel, um, which, which asks about uh, potential approaches to X-linked diseases. And I know that um, some of the programs that you mentioned that we also licensed into uh, Nightstar following its uh, establishment. Um, so the, the Biogen acquisition, as you say, ranks right up there as one of the most valuable British biotechs. But I'm really keen to understand what the acquisition means to firstly the choroideremia program, but then those other programs and the potential impacts 
uh, on patients around the world. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the X-linked uh, retinitis pigmentosa is the second program uh, that Biogen have licensed and taken into uh, to clinical trial. In fact, it was licensed originally to Nightstar. Now, that is a program where we're dealing with a very complicated gene that has a very complicated genetic code that many academics around the world would be unsuccessful in converting into gene therapy because the genetic sequence was too unstable. It became spliced and it deleted sections of it. So in my lab, the previous MRC funded project, we worked out a very good algorithm of codon optimization where we basically stabilized the entire gene we then put that into a viral vector, showed that it could be made reproducibly, and showed efficacy in two separate uh, animal models of the ret X-linked retinitis pigmentosa, uh, which, which was successful. So when a company comes to then look at your, your programs, uh, clearly something that has been de-risked a little bit, because obviously if the virus can be made to a consistent level that's safe, that makes it easier for downstream applications. Um, you know, that, that, is, that is something that makes it very appealing. Um, had we not had the situation with Nightstar, it's possible that we could have taken that program also into phase one clinical trial. But at the time, since Nightstar had been formed and we were developing our croidremia gene therapy program and had made the international connections for us, the logical thing was then to license that program as well. And many of the trial sites around the world, particularly in the USA and in Europe, that previously were involved with the croidremia program are now also recruiting patients with X-linked retinitis pigmentosa. And one of the things that I would say about working with Biogen, um, <clears throat> a lot of the companies are very reluctant to publish data because it's something we do instinctively as academics, but it's something that the corporate world is very, very averse to because they worry that you might publish something that then becomes damaging. And over the years, I've managed to convince Nightstar that publishing data is a good way of validating your program. It's independent peer review, it's scrutiny. And most importantly, the academics who join the trials and get involved and help us, they get something back as well because they get their name on a paper. And so as a result of that, you know, we published our phase one results um, in 2018. And this year in 2020 in Nature Medicine, we published the results of the X-Link Retinitis Pigmentosa trial. The first trial for Retinitis Pigmentosa ever to show a reversal of visual field loss, you know, which is a huge, huge finding. Had we not had that good relationship with them, a lot of that would have been buried away. There might have been a few snippets at investor meetings, but it wouldn't have been subject to vigorous peer review. And again, I think that's the way that we as academics can influence a little bit the commercial world and remind them that published peer review is a very good validation of your program, even in the commercial sector. So, and, and the, the, the size of uh, uh, the patient group in some of those different uh, diseases varies. So choroideremia, a relatively um, a rare illness, but some of the other programs have the potential to, to help much larger numbers of patients? Exactly. I mean, X-linked retinitis pigmentosa is probably the most common of the severe form of, of, of the disease, retinitis pigmentosa. And collectively, you know, retinitis pigmentosa, uh, genetic diseases affecting the eye, is the most common cause now of untreatable blindness in younger people, okay? Partly because the genetic diseases are increasing, and also because we've become much better at managing diabetic retinopathy, which used to be the number one cause. So we're now in a situation where it may be rare, but if you're a young person uh, and you're going blind from an incurable disease, this is the most likely one that, that you're gonna have. And I think, again, the companies appreciate that, particularly a disease that causes blindness at a very early stage is going to have a huge impact on the lifetime of that person. And again, that's where we need to generate a little bit of commercial interest in the product and say, look, there will be enough people around to benefit from this treatment, you know, if we have the investment going forward. Yeah, and, and, and that is a key thing for, for us in that you have potentially a cure here for a, a, a disease that affects a relatively small number of people. So having, uh, let's say, commercial protection around that ensures that the company will invest in it to be able to get the return um, uh, when those, those treatments are delivered. So we have a, a question um, asking about um, what we've learned here for other disease areas. So um, can you give us some examples of, of how your work uh, potentially could help uh, areas beyond retinal um, issues? Yeah, I mean, we're talking about gene therapy treatments. Um, you know, we're looking at gene therapy and vaccines. Um, 
the Oxford vaccine trial, for instance, is a good example of, you know, another application, another, another virus, adenovirus. But also we're looking at applications in the central nervous system, I think predominantly, because the nerve cells are quite easy to target with viruses and they have um, a very long duration of action, the, the adeno associated viral vectors. Uh, we're currently working on uh, using these vectors to develop CRISPR systems, which are uh, it's a way of editing DNA and making small precise corrections to DNA mutations. Uh, and that is an application of the gene therapy platform because you need the gene therapy to get the CRISPR proteins into the neurons to do what they, they need to do. So it's not just a case of treating the eye and replacing genes. It's actually a whole platform technology that has huge implications beyond that. Um, the adeno-associated viruses are being used to treat liver disease. I mean, the same, pretty much the same capsid we're using for the X-linked retinitis pigmentosa trial is being used uh, to treat hemophilia uh, in the liver. So that's again, another application. As we learn more and more about it, we get more confident with using the virus in different ways. And we become more familiar with the side effects. We know how to make it more efficiently and no doubt there'll be more applications uh, to come. Um, it, it looks like some uh, eagle eyed viewers uh, suspect that your shirt um, actually um, has some uh, viral vectors printed on it. Is that is that right? Is that a... <laughs> Yeah, but they need to tell me which, virals, which viruses they are. Uh, ah. Well, they, 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 I think they say, are they the adenoviral uh, uh, vectors? I'm not sure, but... Uh, There's some adenoviral vectors and some lentivirus there as well. Um, so well spotted. And, and what a lovely shirt it is as well. Thank you. Um, so, I, I, I mean, I'm really keen because we're all about, you know, uh, a potential for the future. I'm really keen to hear about what you're working on right now. And I'm sure there's people out there thinking, um, is that something we should be investing in? Well, that's a very good question. Um, you know, we never stop. In fact, one of the nice things about licensing all my programs from the lab to Nightstar is that basically I, I went back into the office and, and, and scratched my head because I thought, well, actually, I can't do any more research because everything's been taken from me. Uh, so you have to sort of reinvent yourself. And so what we've actually been doing is uh, looking entirely at the gene editing uh, potential. Uh, particularly uh, looking at something called base editing, where you can convert a single nucleotide uh, correction. And when we look at the eye diseases, we, we see in the inherited retinal diseases that about 25% of them are caused by a single nucleotide, a single DNA position changing. You know, maybe an A to a G or a C to a T. Now, we're doing a, t a technology with gene therapy where we, we bring in the entire gene and replace it with delivery by a virus. It would be much neater just to correct that single mutation. And then that entire gene is otherwise normal, is gonna start working as it should, and it'll probably be better regulated because it's actually within the DNA. And the specific work we've been doing has been really rather dull and technical. It's just working out the best way of, of placing those gene therapy components uh, the CRISPR gene therapy components into the adeno-associated viral vector. And in fact, our first paper on this topic has shown how the alignment of what's known as the guide RNA, um, as well as the, the Cas9 protein within that vector is quite important in terms of the expression levels. Uh, and also we're looking at the base editing component of that as well. So, you know, this is exciting work that we can do as academics because we're interested in papers and doing academic stuff, but it still has huge potential applications downstream. So I would say to you, if you pick a rare single gene disorder, then yes, it's, it's rare. I mean, choroidrema is one in 50,000. But if you say, right, I'm not treating choroidrema, I'm not, I'm not treating X-linked RP, I'm treating a disease called um, uh, G2A mutation disease, okay? So in other words, any disease, doesn't matter what it is, where it is in your body, if it's caused by a G nucleotide becoming an A, we can treat it, you know, and that's a sort of slightly uh, out of the box way of thinking about diseases, where we don't label them with the phenotype term anymore. We just talk about them at genetic level. There are there are questions um, uh, about uh, asking you to provide uh, an insight into how long it took from your lab research to forming the company um, and then to treating patients. Well, in fact, it, it came the other way around, didn't it? But um, can you give us an idea of, of how long that took, and, and it was relatively quick for Nightstar, um, and then a, any guidance that you would give to early stage researchers who are at the beginning of that path? Yes, so um, I did everything the wrong way around, I'm afraid, and, and I think really it was necessary. Um, 
you know, I am an ophthalmologist and, and, and clearly, you know, my focus is on the clinical domain. So when I applied for funding, uh, I realized that it would be very likely that people on the panel would say, no, it can't be done, or the, the reviewers, the, the ethics uh, approval won't be successful, the ethics committees will reject it. And, and quite often, by the way, these comments are made by individuals who've never actually been to an ethics committee meeting, but nevertheless, quite often very esteemed uh, scientific minds that think that it's not going to happen. So the first thing I did was actually got the ethics approval for the study. I had some charitable funding, which enabled me to, to fund the components of the clinical trial. I then went with that ethics approval to apply for funding, which was successful, which enabled me to start the trial. But at the time, the big problem I had was getting the vector for clinical use, what we call the GMP vector. There was nowhere in the UK that was able to make the AAV vector. There was a company that said, we can make viruses for you to the MHRA requirements for a phase one trial, uh, but we've never made adeno associated viral vectors before, but we're happy to give it a go. Uh, you know, it'll cost you a million pounds, etc. Uh, but we can't guarantee it'll work. That was the best I could get. Most of them really just weren't interested. So I went to the US and again, I flew out to a vector facility. Uh, we went to, to Columbus, Ohio, spent some time there with them explaining about the trial, really getting them engaged with it and said, you know, really convincing them that this is really, we need your help with this. It's an academic center. And they then made the viral vector for us at a reasonable price. The MHRA had to send a qualified person out to check everything was being done correctly, but it all happened. And we had everything set up so efficiently that when the viral vector was made, it came into the UK, it had to be import, you know, had to be cleared. It was two weeks from when the plane landed to when that first patient was treated. That patient gained vision. Subsequently, other patients we saw in the trial gained vision. And within a year, it was quite obvious that something very exciting was happening. And of course, that's when we got involved with looking at the next stages of the trial and, and where we had the formation of Nightstar. So that would have been 2009, the grant, first patient injected 2011, and then the formation of Nightstar around about 2013, end of 2013, beginning of 2014, uh, with, that, with that very initial data. So I think, you know, ethics committees, sorry, Grant committees like things to be de-risked because they're always easy to say things won't work. They're reluctant to put their neck out and say, yes, fund it. So we de-risk the grant application by having the ethics committee approval. And then we de-risk the company investment by having very good phase one data showing above all else, excellent safety, but also some early signs of efficacy. And I think, you know, as academic clinicians, we need to think about this pathway very carefully, but actually, you know, we do know a lot about the diseases which we treat patients every day with, and we know about the risks of the disease and we know how that works. So it's important, I think, that we think about the clinical trial. And, and I would always advise to try and get as far as you can with your program as an academic, at least into phase one trial before then handing over. We, we can't do phase three trials because we need to employ you know, regulatory affairs specialists and all sorts of people who are commercial people. Uh, but we can do phase one trials very, very effectively uh, and very knowledgeably. And I think that helps the companies a lot further on downstream. That's great. Thank you. Um, there are there are many questions uh, um, on the YouTube channel that we're, we're not going to be able to ask. Um, uh, Brian asked one that's, that's close to my heart. Do we know that there are many um, UK spin out companies that are on similar journeys that are likely to have uh, hopefully similar impacts? And, uh, you know, I mentioned before that um, there are a lot of spinet companies coming out of Oxford, uh, hopefully on similar journeys. Um, so really, it's now for me to conclude and say thank you very much, Robert, for that fascinating insight into the deservedly award-winning Nightstar uh, story. Uh, to thank our audience for the uh, questions and to say please do join us on the next Innovation Conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for listening.